for all you guys who think that it was probably weird to pray for power in the building, that's because the power went out in the building about 30 minutes ago. So if it does, keep calm, I guess. Uh, 1 Samuel 16, have you guys turned there? We're in this series, David from Servant to King. And it took us a few minutes, but we finally got to David last week. Just to recap for a minute on this, Saul is king, but there's kind of some trouble in paradise. We've read how, how the Lord has some regrets about, about this move. And if we know anything about when the Lord has regretted in the past, it usually doesn't work out too well. Ask Noah, for example, what happens when the Lord regrets? Thankfully here, the, the Lord is uh, regretful about Saul, but he doesn't do a reboot on society. So Saul is king for now. And last week we read how David was chosen by the Lord to be anointed king. Jesse paraded his seven older sons before Samuel, each one being rejected by the Lord. One by one, God says no until there's only one left. And even with only one left, you see Jesse still a little bit hesitant. Like, yeah, there's, there's one more, but, but he's the youngest. And he's just out tending to the sheep. Like, this can't be the one that you want. I've, I've, I've shown you my seven olders. You guys ever been guilty of trying to bargain your way into something from the Lord? Put something on your heart, gives you something to do. You offer him one thing and he says, nope. You offer him another, he's like, still no. Usually, usually we know what the Lord is asking and we're, we're, we're afraid or we're insecure or maybe we just don't trust him enough. So David's been anointed and the spirit of the Lord has come upon David. And we pick up here, 1 Samuel 16, 14 and 15. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Saul's servants then said to him, behold now an evil spirit from the Lord is terrorizing you. I wanna talk for a minute tonight about who God is. I think we can hear verses like this and we can sometimes struggle with the identity or the character of God. We can struggle with who God actually is because the world has given us a softer version of God. The enemy, my friends, is crafty. We have a kid's book version of God, a version that is, that is bubbly and colorful and smiley, a jolly version of the Lord. And unfortunately, I think that sometimes even as believers that we're okay with that. If there's no fear, then there's no conviction. And if there's no conviction, there's no need for repentance. It's impossible for us to fully grasp who God is. A couple years ago, uh, Kelly and I and, and the family, we stopped by the Grand Canyon on our way to Florida. And I know what you're thinking, of course you did. That's where everybody stops on their way from Michigan to Florida. We, we, we had a, a detour to, to Las Vegas in, in between there, and that's a story for another time. But you see, the, the Grand Canyon, when we got there, it was massive and it was beautiful. It was dangerous and scary and lovely all at the same time. You see pictures of its beauty, but until you stand face to face with it and still you, until you stand at the edge you're never really able to fully understand how powerful it is. You're not able to grasp how big it is, how vast the expanse is when you stand there at it. How something so gorgeous and so powerful is deserving of so much respect. And we started a series this past Sunday about love, who God is, on the loving side. And we, we looked at lots of verses in 1 John about God being 
love. We look to verses throughout the gospels, throughout Romans telling us about God's love for us. God demonstrates his love for us. God so loved the world. The father's willingness to sacrifice his son for you and I, for the lost. That he's not wanting any to perish, but for all to come to repentance, as we're told in 2 Peter 3, 9. And all these things are true. God is an amazing father and God is love. But these two verses that we just read right here should make our blood run cold. If you're reading them and you're thinking that there's no way, my God would never send an evil spirit. He wouldn't, he'd never, he can't. It's not in God's character. And I'm sorry, my friends, you have probably had your ears tickled. This spirit, whether allowed or sent specifically from God is a judgment on Saul's life. Saul who rejected the word of the Lord just one chapter earlier. This judgment, this is a judgment and a call for repentance from a righteous and holy God, a beautiful and amazing and massive and powerful God who deserves all of the glory, all of the honor, and all our praise. A God that has the power to call or command any being in the universe that he needs to. Let's look at Matthew 8. Starting in verse 28. It says here, when he came to the other side in the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. And they cried out saying, what business do we have with each other, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. The demons began to entreat him saying, if you're going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, go. And they came out and went into the swine and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished into the water. Jesus and the disciples out here doing ministry work at this time, we're starting to see miraculous works of Jesus and and healings. And we come upon the incident at Gadarenes. Jesus is met by two demon-possessed men here. Luke and Mark would tell us that they refer to themselves as legion, that they are many. And in verse 29, these demons address Jesus as the son of God. They know exactly who God is and they know exactly how powerful he is and exactly what he is capable of. And in verse 32, with just one word, Jesus says, go. And they leave the men, are thrown into the swine and they rush off the cliff. Mark says in chapter one, he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey and listen to him. You don't need to flip to these here, but you wanna know who our God really is? Jeremiah 19, 15. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I am out to bring on this city and all its towns, the entire calamity that I have declared against it because they have stiffened their necks so as not to heed my words. First Peter four seventeen. says, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? In Revelation 19, 
11 through 16. It says, and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We serve a God who in our rebellion can call judgment down on our life whenever and however he sees fit. I was praising the Lord in conversation with a brother last night. Both of us so thankful that in our sinful rebellion, the Lord didn't harden our hearts, didn't stop pursuing us, didn't send us to our rightfully deserved judgment right then and there. Praise a merciful God for his undeserving grace. But unfortunately for Saul, right now he's in the thick of it. Saul's servants realize it too. And when they do, this is what happens. Let's flip back to Samuel 16. Starting in verse 16, It says, let our Lord now command your servants who were before you. Let them seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you, that he shall play the harp with his hand and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the young men said, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful musician, a mighty man of valor, a warrior, one prudent in speech and a handsome man. And the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jerusalem or to Jesse and said, send me your son, David, who is with the flock. I wonder what David's first thought was here. Samuel visiting Jesse and David watching his dad scroll through all of his brothers, being chosen by the Lord. Listen to the words used to describe David here. They call him a man of valor. He was courageous in the face of danger. He was a warrior, prudent, meaning to be wise in speech. But most importantly, it says that he was recognized as having the Lord with him. All these great qualities that are here that we read about, the anointing that happened a few verses earlier, all this potential for greatness. And in this moment, David is humbly asked to do one thing and one thing only, play the harp. You wonder if the spirit had to tell David here, like, be still and trust in me. Be still, David, and trust my plan. I know this doesn't look like what you thought, but I promise it's all got a purpose. When was the last time that you needed to hear that in your marriage, in your life, in a tough day, argument with your spouse, Maybe a season where you just can't seem to get on the same page with each other. Things aren't aren't clicking. They're not working out. Kids have gone wild. Anxieties are, are running high. Be still and trust my plan. Be in my word. Be in prayer. First thing I want to look at here is 
Saul's servants noticed that the Lord was with David. In your life, in your marriage, does anyone notice you as having the Lord with you? A marriage that is centered completely on Christ. We're recognized by the cars we drive, the houses we live in, the clothes we wear, our job titles, our looks, our kids. We're human. It's okay. We recognize things. David was recognized for a lot of things here as well. He was described as having a lot of really great qualities. But most importantly, he was known for having the Lord. The one thing that our eternity rests on. None of these other qualities that we have, none of these other things that people look upon us and see will matter for our eternal destination. The only thing that will matter is will you be known as having the Lord? A few things I'm not talking about here is I'm not just talking about going to church. People would have built altars, would have worshiped uh, in the time of Saul. So a form of weekly worship would not have necessarily stood out. Lots of people today are known as people who go to church. Not talking about just telling someone in word that you will pray for them. I can point to many people that have no idea who Jesus is and does not set foot in any type of of church or worship or anything like that. But they'll be quick to say, I'm praying for you. Praying for you. Don't worry, I'll pray for you. Somewhat of a worldly saying now. Saul's servants didn't say, behold, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite who wears a cross necklace and has a fish sticker on the bumper of his chariot. David was known as a man that the Lord was with. Do people look at you and see that God is with you? Acts 4.13 Acts 4.13 says, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. You have Peter and John preaching amongst the high priest, amongst rulers, amongst scribes in the midst of these so-called religious people, well-educated people. And yet Peter and John were recognized as being with Jesus. Scripture even says that there was nothing else besides confidence that could be observed. They were uneducated and untrained. What does your marriage represent? A couple who is recognized as having the Lord with them doesn't just go to church, they are the church. They don't always tell someone they'll pray for them. When the time is right, they grab their hand and they pray for them right there. Hey, can we do this right now? They encourage people and counsel people. They disciple people. They live as selfless as possible, making sure that any interaction they have that Christ is always noticed. And when that light is noticed, others will want it and you will be called upon to use it. So are you humble enough when called upon to remove yourself from the situation? The task that the Lord has called you to do and get to work. Sometimes we're going to have to realize that the task given to us from the Lord isn't always the job that we thought we were applying for. Sometimes it's a grind. Some days you're in tears together with a couple who desperately needs Jesus in their life. Other days you might be sitting across from an inmate at the county jail 
and you're hearing things and having to walk somebody through things that you never thought you'd hear from somebody before. Some days the Lord has ministry work for you and you just wanna sit on the couch. No joke, guys, I've had those days. Rainy, cold day. Perfect day here. Could have stayed home. And look at all of you excited to be here tonight. Sometimes we come into our walk broken. Sometimes on fire. We all come to know the Lord at different times in different ways. No two situations are exactly the same. We have skills and gifts and talents, many given by the Lord. And in Samuel verse 18, we continue on with some of those gifts that David had. It says that David was ruddy. Ruddy meaning he was healthy. He, he, he had a healthy appearance about him. He was a skillful musician. Maybe the next great worship leader. He was a mighty man of valor and a warrior. So he was brave. And he was one prudent in speech. Maybe he thought he was anointed to become the next great prophet or the next great preacher. And it says he was a handsome man. He had an appearance that was comfortable for people to be around. All these things, all these characteristics, we'll see him use these characteristics in the future. But that's not what he was called to today. He had a whole tool chest full of amazing qualities, full of amazing gifts from the Lord. And all he was called to do at this time was play the harp. In verse 23, it says, So it came about whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand. And Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. He didn't have to talk, use his speech, his valor, his bravery. God needed him to play the harp for the man that he would soon replace. He needed him to quietly get some on the job training. Many of you in here probably went to college and, and got degrees. You guys all look very scholarly and astute. Toward the end of your schooling time, you might have found yourself in an apprenticeship of sorts. Possibly after graduating, you went out to, to get a job with a company and, and you didn't walk in and have them offer you the keys to the building or the keys to the company right away. He had what's called an entry-level job. It's not that uncommon. 20 years or so ago, I walked into Coca-Cola for an interview. I thought it was pretty great back then. I remember walking through the warehouse and sitting with a guy in some nice slacks with a button-down shirt, thinking in the back of my mind that I could probably do that job very well. The truth is I was such a wreck of a man and a terrible husband that I didn't even fill out the application myself. My wife sent the application for me. Praise the Lord for his mercy on a wretched sinner and praise the Lord for such a strong spouse. We didn't know the Lord back then, but he gave me a fighter. And couples, I wanna tell you something right now. If you're married to a strong Jesus loving spouse, Hit your knees and thank the Lord every day for that. And if you're married to a wretched sinner, you pray and you fight every single day. Knowing that you serve a God who still turns water into wine. And my marriage is a testimony to that. So I interview at Coke and I get the job but I didn't get the keys to the building. Didn't get to wear a nice suit. I did get a button down shirt and in red letters, it said Coca-Cola across the left chest. 
I didn't get the keys to the building, but I got keys to a rusty old international semi truck with no AC, no radio, delivering pop in a hundred degree heat in Clearwater, Florida. I lost like 15 pounds that summer. Do you think they were nuts? They weren't going to give me a job in management when I had no experience. And David wasn't ready either. And the Lord knew that. But God used an evil spirit to bring David into Saul's life. For David to prove his obedience, even in the little things. And prepared David to lead his people. Because God works all things, even the occasional evil spirit for good to those who love him. What is the Lord calling you to do? Each one of you has a lot of gifts given to you from the Lord. Are you using them the way that God has asked you to do? When the Lord has blessed us with so many gifts, it's easy for pride to get in our way. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty, arrogant spirit before stumbling. But sometimes in our own pride and arrogance, we see our inability to be patient and to wait on the Lord. I mean, David had walked in there like some kind of cowboy to Saul, guns blazing, talking about his anointing and how great he is. Saul would have probably had him executed right away. We can self-sabotage because we think we are more important than God's plan. Sometimes the most powerful being in the universe, regardless of all the gifts that we have, simply asks us to play the harp. Jeremiah 28, 11. Or 2911. Thank you. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. The Lord knew the plans he had for David. Far before David, and it all started with playing the harp. What has the Lord given you to do as a follower, as a disciple maker, as a husband, as a wife, as a mother, as a father? Are you missing out on the greatness that God has in store for you? The miracle that might be around the corner because your pride has gotten you into a spot where you're not willing to trust God in what seems like the smallest of tasks. And if you don't feel like God has a task for you, then maybe you've gotten a little stale in your walk. It happens to us all at times. We can can drown out or stifle the spirit. Or maybe if you don't feel the Holy Spirit calling you to do work, you might need to be honest with yourself on what your relationship with the Lord really is. If you've truly accepted Jesus as your Lord, the great commission was given to us all. And at the very least, we should feel the call to preach the gospel and make disciples. Maybe an all powerful, mighty, amazing, righteous and beautiful, loving God is giving you the chance to repent and accept him today is offering you the chance to accept the bloodshed sacrifice of his son, Christ, on the cross right now. Would you bow your heads? No matter where you are in your walk, the Lord has work for you today. Big or small, the spirit was tugging at Saul He had his chance and then it was gone. I hope no one in this room misses their chance. Father God, we give thanks to you. God, for your word, for your love, for your greatness, for your protection. God, for your willingness to to stick by 
a bunch of wretched sinners, Lord, for you to be there when we come crawling back to you. God, I pray for every marriage in this room and in this community, Lord, I pray that you be at work. God, that your spirit strengthens us and that you watch over us. God, we, we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.